The views shared on this podcast are those of Mike Sowers and do not represent those of Commercial Investors Group. The information shared is not investment advice. Please consult your financial, legal, and tax advisors before making an investment decision. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.crefranchise.com And as a bonus, just for attending, I'm going to throw in a free audio copy of my book, as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools. That's www.crefranchise.com. We'll see you in there. Hey, everybody. Mike Sowers here. I got Kevin Bupp on the show. And uh, today's show is going to be awesome. We cover mobile home parks and how Kevin went from literally being declined on a $12 purchase when he hit rock bottom in the 2008 crisis to now owning... 18 mobile home parks and having done 40 to 45 mobile home park deals. So he takes you through the journey. He talks about how focusing on fitness and getting your mind right was the key to him getting back in the game. He talked about the importance of having a niche and staying in your lane within that niche and always doing the right thing and valuing relationships uh, and um, your relationships with people over personal gain. And then he uncovers some super secret nuggets about how to go from raising capital on individual deals to being able to start a multi-fund asset. So if you're doing really well, you got five or 10 deals under your belt and you're looking to kind of go to that next step and start pre-raising some capital in advance on a pre-raise, this episode is definitely for you. And he's gonna give you some of the secrets and tips on how to structure those um, payouts and how you're splitting the profit with your partners. And he also includes some nuggets about what types of things you should be including on your offering to other people. Uh, welcome to this episode and we'll get started right after this. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those that worry sharing their ideas will hinder their success and those who are driven by the success of others. The first kind view everyone as a competitor. They guard their playbook tight to their chest, rarely collaborate outside their inner circle and are reluctant to show their cards. Then there are the second kind, the kind who have graduated from the first category. They don't count the number of deals they've done. What counts to them is the number of people they impact and the depth to which they impact them. Achievement is still important to them, but it's subordinated to the depth of their purpose. So they give freely of their time, knowledge, and expertise to build a bridge for those who follow in their footsteps. These are the people who were called to change the world. These are the people who develop people, places, and ideas. This is the show where they do it on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Hey, it's Mike Sowers, and joining me today is Kevin Bupp. And Kevin is a mobile home parking uh, investing guru, and he also uh, is getting into some surface lot stuff. Uh, Welcome to the show, Kevin. Mike, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, well, I'm excited for today's episode. I, I really want to help our listeners understand, you know, that there's other options out there. It seems like uh, kind of apartment syndications, the, the the sexy person in the room that everybody's going after. And uh, you kind of found a couple of different niches here. And so let's start off by uh, talking about how you got into mobile park investing and why you kind of transitioned out of doing single family stuff into that. Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a great question, and uh, and I and I've owned uh, many different types of real estate, but like a lot of folks, I got started buying single family properties way back in my my early twenties. I mean, right at uh, twenty years old, I bought my first single family, and um, and I was really just going at the guidance of my mentor at the time, right? That's what he did, and uh, he had a business built around single family and small multifamily rental properties, and so I just really followed his model. And it seems like that's what most people do that get into real estate investing. They typically follow that, you know, the path of least resistance. There's the most information out there on single family investing. You can go back then you could have went to the library and found books on it. Nowadays, I mean, there's just a litany of information out there on it and it's fairly 
fairly low barrier to entry to get started. And so we, we did that, um, ultimately realized that there was uh, more efficiencies and uh, multifamily properties uh, a few years into the game. Started buying apartment complex, you know, smaller apartment complexes, you know, 12 units, 26 units, 36 units, things like that. And then back in 2012, I guess 2011, actually, uh, I was introduced again, just by kind of by accident. Uh, it wasn't anything I was really looking for. It just was brought to my attention. I was introduced to mobile home parks. And uh, I had never really considered that asset class. Um, I like to be, I've always considered myself a, somewhat of a contrarian investor. I like going, you know, the opposite direction of the herd. Um, and uh, mobile home parks seem to, to, to fit that mold quite well. Uh, you know, there was no information out there on the topic. I literally couldn't find anyone that I knew that owned a mobile home park or had ever owned a mobile home park. And, uh, and it was intriguing enough that um, I decided to dive in. And I bought that, I bought my very first park in 2012. So it was about a year after I kind of learned of the niche. And, you know, it's really, it's just a, it's a different form of multifamily. It really is. I mean, it's got its unique nuances, but it's really, it's a multifamily investment with uh, a few different variables that are involved. And um, that first mobile home park went really well. It was a highly distressed asset. You know, look in 2012, this is, there's still a lot of distressed assets that were flooding the marketplace as a result of the 2008, you know, financial crisis. And so, this was a highly distressed asset, uh, something I was very comfortable with, something that uh, I had done many times in the past, just not with a mobile home park. And uh, uh, that was in Atlanta, Georgia, bought it. Took about uh, eight or nine months to, to turn it around and you know learn what I knew and what I didn't know about that niche and made a bunch of mistakes along the way. And uh, ultimately, you know, turned it into a cash flow machine. In fact, we just sold that asset uh, about five months ago. And so owned it for quite a number of years, paid for itself. 10 times over again, and uh, was just a phenomenal investment. So it just, I, I realized that there was something special there. And it was, again, it was something that a lot of other investors weren't chasing after, right? Like you mentioned, multifamily is kind of the flavor of the day today. I mean, it's such a competitive environment trying to find a quality multifamily deal at a, at a fair price. Um, and uh, that's kind of the case nowadays with mobile home parks, but that wasn't the case in 2012. And so we decided to kind of run at it. I bought my second park, bought a third park, bought a fourth park. And, you know, now, you know, nearly... I guess, you know, going on nine to 10 years thereafter, uh, we've bought, I don't even know the, the total number, probably have, have probably have owned, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 45 parks. I've never actually ta tallied up the entire number. Uh, currently today, we own 18 parks in a number of different markets and, um, and the niche street list quite well. So not to give you the long-winded answer of how we got introduced to mobile home parks, but ultimately that's it. <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. So did you, once you started getting into parks, did you just kind of divest out of all your single family stuff that you were Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I didn't divest uh, uh, by, by choice of, of a lot of my other things. So I, you know, I had a, I had a fairly significant single family holdings uh, down here in Southwest Florida uh, leading into 2007, 2008, and also about 500 apartment doors. And, um, this area absolutely got crushed, even with the low leverage point. Um, we had a lot of folks moving out of Florida at that point in time. A lot of jobs were construction-based jobs. You know, construction just halted for a period of a couple of years, and it was kind of a bloodbath. And so um, I had lots of challenges uh, holding on to my single-family home portfolio, lots of rent concessions. I mean, it was just a, it was a very challenging time. And so ultimately, um, I lost a lot of everything I had at that period, a lot of single-family stuff. Um, and then the multifamily properties – we pretty much had to fire sell, uh, given the type of loan programs that we had in place. Lots of you know five year terms. Um, no one was lending at that point in time. We couldn't get new debt put in place, and so ended up selling out of the you know the apartments. A lot of the single family stuff went back to the bank, uh, not by choice. And uh, so I was left with pretty much nothing um, after two thousand and eight. I mean, uh, basically had three three properties out of at 100, 122 single family and about 500 apartment doors. And after it was all said and done, had three rental properties left over um, after the, the smoke kind of cleared. And so, uh, again, I did divest of everything, but not necessarily by choice. And uh, ultimately rebuilt for a couple of years, just trying to, trying to get, get things straight, tried to work back up the courage even to, uh, to, to, you know, to step back into the, the ring again. And uh, ultimately, that's when mobile home parks you know, came to the picture, came to the picture. And uh, that was kind of my, my first foray back into real estate after, you know, call it a two and a half to three year hiatus. Well, I think there's some learning lessons in there. If you don't mind, <laughs> I, I want to dive into sure. that. Right. So our show, our show is geared a lot towards kind of newbie investors and getting started and stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the best way to learn is to crash and burn, right? Everybody fails at multiple points in their life. It's, it's not like you're going to fail. It's just a matter of time. Um, it's what you do after you fail and you got, you got back up and you built something that's incredible. So tell me like through that failure, um, 
what were the biggest learning lessons that like from that learning, if you had gone back and started over again, obviously you can't predict things that can happen in the market, but how can people that are just getting started today take those lessons you learn in order to protect themselves against a potential market crash? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the big things with single family, and I'm not saying that, you know, there's plenty, there's, there's plenty of smart single family, you know, uh, portfolio operators, right? We've got some big, you know, big private equity groups in the game. And so, but I would say that one of the big challenges was, was the inefficiencies with that single family home portfolio, you know, and uh, although we had a fairly low leverage point, um, you know, we had a lot of loans that were cross, a lot of properties that were cross collateralized, and these properties were spread out amongst uh, five and sometimes even six different counties. I mean, it was a pretty wide swath. And uh, th these were all rental properties. Everything I ever bought, I mostly bought the intent of holding and uh, you know, in, in cash flowing. And the inefficiencies that existed with having them spread out amongst such a large area um, proved challenging. Uh, even in the good times, it proved challenging. And when things, you know, when we saw a little bit of a blip, number one, down in Southwest Florida, as I'd mentioned, construction job, construction, um, was one of the primary occupations uh, during the big boom. I mean, there was a massive boom from like 02 to, to 07 down here, just, you know, things being built left and right. Sure. And when that all left, you know, you found that there was a lot of excess inventory in the marketplace. And uh, a lot of that excess inventory was owned by builders. These were brand new homes that were your rooftops that were built for a population that was not there. It hadn't, it wasn't even there before the crash. And it actually, you know, the population went down for a period of time because people had to move somewhere where there was a job. A lot of folks went back up to you know, North Carolina or Tennessee. They call them halfbacks, right? They kind of left Florida and went halfway back up North. And, um, and so, I think just uh, you know the inefficiencies with the single family um, was a big was a big challenge even before that crash. But then once we had to start giving rental concessions and you know there was a quite a bit of vacancy in the Southwest Florida market for a number of years, um, it was it was a mountain that we were unable to to to, to climb away to the top. So we basically had to uh, work with banks, did a lot of short sales. Um, you know, the challenging thing about that was in the beginning for the first year, year and a half, banks didn't even know what to do. Banks literally didn't have loss mitigation departments. They didn't have these programs set up. They didn't have the staffing to handle the tidal wave of, of foreclosures that were coming their way. And so while we tried to scramble and keep things together for the, you know, for the initial year, uh, I realized very quickly that, you know, things were going to fall apart faster than what the banks were going to get their act together and, and offer programs such as short sales or loan modifications or what have you. And so in any event, I guess to answer your original question, the inefficiencies, that's a big one. I just, again, there's folks out there that have figured it out. I just think that it's a much more efficient um, investment to own instead of 12 single family properties own a 12 unit apartment complex. It just makes more sense. It's in one location. You got all the air conditioners there in one location. You got the rooftop in one location. And uh, as far as leasing is concerned, you don't have a leasing agent running around to 12 different properties. They're all right there in that one location. So that was a massive lesson. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we divested of our apartment complexes, not by choice, but because it was, it was a fire sale type situation. We had to kind of, um, uh, we had to find a repair for, you know, what was ultimately happening at that point in time and things were just falling apart completely. So sure. um, in any event, that, that's, uh, that's one of the big lessons, the inefficiencies of single family, just there's easier ways to make money in real estate and the same is applicable to like mobile home parks, much more uh, efficiencies to scale a business with mobile home parks than that of single family properties. Sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll jump into that in a minute. Um, I'm curious, when you bought a lot of those properties on the front end, were you mm -hmm. like rehabbing them and kind of doing more value add where you're adding a lot more value than it was costing you to do so? Which properties? The single family? Yeah, the single family. Yeah, well, no, most of the things that we bought, we would we would rehab, but most of it, you know, a rental rehab is very different than that of like a retail flip. And so um, yeah, we would do renovations to them. Um, you know, a lot of times we go in and put, you know, tile floors throughout Florida, we've got hurricanes and things of that nature. We've got flooding events. And so we kind of made them, you know, renter proof. We wouldn't go spend, you know, $50,000 on a, you know, 1400 square foot home rehab. Normally it'd be somewhere in the realm of like 15 to $20,000, nice kitchen, nice bathroom, but fairly basic in nature. And then again, fairly basic, but robust flooring. A lot of times ceramic tile down here, it makes the most sense. And it, it stands up to a lot of abuse. And sure. so, no, I mean, we would, you know, our leverage point again, when, when things started going the, you know, the, the wrong direction, our leverage point, our leverage point across our entire single family home portfolio was right in the like 62 to 63% range. So, I mean, we weren't over leveraged. The challenge that, that occurred was number one, rental rates. I know everyone says rental rates never go down. Well, they, they did. And they did for a period of time down here because there was excess inventory in the marketplace, right? So 
folks were given three months free rent, TVs away if you rented the unit. I mean, like it was just concession after concession to get bodies into your rental unit. And so that also meant folks were lowering rents. If you used to get 995, now you might have to offer 895 and two months free, you know, two months free rent. So that was a big one, but also the values that, 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 you know, approximately 40%, you know, equity on paper, right? Cause it's just paper money. It's paper money until you can actually spend it. Um, that went away. That literally went away within, within less than a year, within eight months. Um, we either had zero equity or actually upside in some of the markets we were in, we we're upside down, um, within with, with less than a year period of time. So it, um, yeah, no, it just, uh, yeah. It, if you were well capitalized in 2009, 2010, you could you were you were buying absolutely phenomenal deals in Southwest oh, Florida. <laughs> yeah, no, that's always the conundrum, right? When the money's plentiful, like right now, it's a little bit harder to find deals because a lot of people are getting into it. It's easier to fund them, and then the op the opposite's true, right? When all the funding dries up and everybody's going into foreclosure or whatever, then you can find all the deals, but you can't find the funding. Uh, so yeah, I mean, as far as like scaling up by, by doing buildings where you're, you're buying multiple units under one roof for some of the efficiencies and then, uh, and, and then continuing on with the value add stuff. So uh, those are great lessons mentally. What did it take for you to go from just being absolutely crushed to like realizing that some of those things were outside of your control and getting back in the, in the seat? Yeah, no, that's a re- that's a really that's a really good question. I you know I I um obviously there were some dark days. I mean, if anyone that says there wouldn't that that there wasn't that went through something like that, then they're lying to you. So there was definitely some dark days. But you know, I made a I made a pretty drastic shift health wise, and I was always I always felt I was a fairly healthy person, but I really shifted to something I could control because um, these things seemingly were out of my control. You know what was happening with the market and the economy and and um and, and finances and what have you. And so I just really made an absolute 180 degree shift in my my health and well being and figured that the one thing I can control is how my mind, you know, my clarity, my mental energy, my my physical stamina, what have you. And so I just went on like a vegan diet for for many, many months, you know, started cleansing on a regular basis, you know, juicing a lot and exercising like crazy. And uh that that was that was such a huge help just knowing that there was at least one thing in my life that I was in control of. But in addition to that, I felt really good. Uh, you know, I, I felt very, very good as an individual. And uh, that was probably the biggest one thing. I mean, that literally, again, still challenging times, but that was the biggest one thing that allowed me to help push through and figure out what the next steps were going to be. And so that ultimately led me to a few other businesses outside of real estate. Um, I really got into to running marathons and cycling long distance events and triathlons. And I, it really it led me down a different path. And during the couple of years that I wasn't an active real estate investor, I started a few other businesses that were related to health and fitness and just figured that I would go all in and, and do something that at that point in my life made me happy because real estate did not make me happy for, for a period of time, right? <laughs> so that was it. And then I also met my, who is my now wife. I met her literally right before everything hit the fan. Like we were dating literally for oh, a couple nice. weeks before shit hit the fan. And uh, she was another big part of it. I mean, I, I, yeah, she, she really, really helped helped me through and kind of gave me like a, a you know, a, an additional light at the end of the tunnel as far as, uh, you know, just positive energy and, and being very supportive. So, yeah, I mean, that's important. I did. I mean, uh, it's, it's crazy when you go through dark times, like, and if somebody sticks by you through all that and like, is your beacon, how, like how much that can, uh, like, uh, strengthen the bonds of the relationship, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. It was huge. I don't think she realized how bad it was going to get. I remember that. <laughs> I remember the day I told her that like, Next week, like I'm about to default on, there's going to be a number of defaults and she was like, ah, I'm sure you'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, kind of blew it off. <laughs> Just an eternal think, optimist. Huh? I think it got real to her uh, about, about two, maybe about two or three months later, we were eating breakfast and I, I dropped my car off across the street to get detailed. And at that point in time, it was probably three or four months in at that point in time, I had a number of, uh, you know, 60, 90 day lates. And what, what started occurring is I had never default on any consumer debt. So no credit cards, no, no basically nothing else other than mortgages. And, and the only ones I could, I defaulted on immediately were ones that were banks wouldn't work. Like they couldn't work with me. They didn't have departments set up to work with me. And I had no other option. And, um, we were eating breakfast and I dropped my car off across the street to get washed. It was like $12. And at that point in time, you know, my credit card started shutting me off because they stole these defaults, in my mortgages. So all these, you know, I had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars open credit limits. Uh, and basically within a matter of like 30 days, all but one discovers the only one that kept open, but they literally took my limit from like, I think that one was like 25,000 to like $500. Right. And so it became a situation where like, I literally couldn't, I couldn't buy anything on credit. I had to basically use whatever cash I had 
you know, IE debit card, right? Whatever's in my account is what I was spending. And I went to pay for my $12, my $12 uh, car wash with my debit card and it got declined. And at that point I called, you know, called the bank and my, 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 my account had gotten, you know, garnished by one of the lenders, like completely wiped out. That was the point where I think uh, my now wife, realize that that shit was pretty real <laughs> that also, there, there's really no money left there's really so, no money left so that was the that was the bottom for you when your $12 that was the bottom. purchase got declined okay I'm that up. was bottom that was the bottom i literally had uh yeah i mean i had another one other account with a minimal amount of money just to survive but like that was it they, they caught me off guard and completely swiped uh, a significant amount of funds out of my bank account Hey, what's up everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.cre franchise.com and as a bonus just for attending i'm going to throw in a free audio copy of my book as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools that's www.crefranchise.com we'll see you in there yeah. well hey man let's talk about how you went from that point where you were at rock bottom to where you're at now and uh what were the steps on how you rebuilt and then as you walk through that story I'm really curious to see how the market shifted and what you were continuing to do as more and more people got into this uh, mobile home investing, right? Yeah. A lot of the kind of gurus and stuff started teaching this. And I imagine more and more people started getting into that. And yeah. where are we at today? So take, take me through that journey. Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, you know, the, the real estate fire never fully left my belly. You know, it kind of just got suppressed for a, for a period of a couple of years as I focused on health and fitness and a few businesses related to that. But, you know, the, the fire never really went away and it was always burning there. And, um, and I finally acknowledged it after like three years, like the businesses I was running, they made money. They kept a roof over my head. They kept food on the table, but like, I didn't have the desire to like build and scale them and turn them into more than what they were. Right. It was just, it was almost a way to pass the time. And again, you'll keep a roof over my head and food on the table more than anything sure. else. And to you know, stay focused on, on the health and fitness part of my life. And so I really started kind of uh, going back on a journey, um, 2011, just to real, you know, to really take a, um, a strong look at how the real estate landscape had changed. And I started talking to folks that either maybe just gotten into real estate, right? Cause you got, the, you got two different batches of investors, really. You got those that were uh, in the, well, really three. So those that were in real estate before the crash got crushed, but never got back in. You got those that were in real estate, went through the crash, came out on the other side, maybe with some bumps and bruises, but they came out. And then you got those that kind of started, you know, when things were really distressed and they started buying, they built their business from that point forward, right? They haven't really gone through a downturn yet. And so sure. I really wanted to talk to, I didn't really care about talking to those that didn't get back into real estate. I wanted to talk to those that made it through the crash and got back in. And also those that were, that were, you know, heavy into it, call it starting 2009, 2010 and thereafter. And I wanted to figure out how the landscape had changed. I, you know, speaking to lenders, you know, lending was so different, so different than what it was in 2008. It was just a, a very different world. In addition to that, I, I wanted to, I was really looking for an opportunity to, to, to scale fairly quickly. I, I wanted to buy, I didn't want to buy any more single family homes. I knew that absolutely. Like I looked back and reflected on what I felt not went wrong with our business, but like what I could have been do doing better. Like what would have been a more efficient way to build a, a profitable company and quickly determine that, apartments was the way to go, right? Like that, that was the, the, the way that I was going to rebuild things. But during that period of time, I got introduced to a, a, a guy through a mutual friend, um, just another businessman that ultimately uh, owns, he owned mobile home parks. I had lunch with him one day and we got talking about real estate, got talking about his business, didn't know that he owned mobile home parks. That's what he owned. He had lended on for 30 years during, as a banker, started buying them after his retirement, had a small portfolio of like four parks, they're fairly large parks. And, um, and, and literally, talked my ear off for like two hours about all the great things about mobile home parks and why I should consider that over apartments. And after that two hour lunch of going through this exploratory process and having a two hour lunch, I decided that I was going to you know, learn more about parks and, and uh, see if they really 
were as good as what uh, his name was Randy, what Randy made them out to be. And so that, that, that literally set me on my path. That one thing alone, it was exciting to me because I'd never heard anybody else talk about mobile home park. So it was kind of like this, this little underground secret society of these mobile home park owners. Like really they make that right. much money. And, uh, and so that, that, that set me on my quest and, you know, studied as much as I could. There wasn't a lot of information out there. There were some forums, you know, I dug deep, found other owners, you know, bought them lunch, you know, learned about their business, the different nuances. And uh, ultimately it took me about a year to buy the first one, but bought that first park. And, and uh, like I said, it went really well and uh, we made a lot of money on that park, cash flow quite well, great returns and figured we'd try to replicate it and bought the second one and bought the third one. And, how we did that though. So I know the, the big question a lot of folks are going to have is like, how'd you do it? You literally had, you, you truly, I didn't have much money at all. Like those businesses I was running prior to getting back in, I didn't have a millions of dollars in savings. I literally had right. like $50,000 to my name when I decided to get back into real estate. So surely not enough to go buy a mobile home park for the most part. But, but you know, when things were going bad, I had a lot of private lenders um, that, that we had built relationships with over the years. And I worked incredibly hard, not just with the private lenders, but with the banks as well to, to make things right. I mean, to truly make things right, I just didn't throw my hands up and say, you know what, take all my properties, you know, I'm done, call it quits. Um, I worked very diligently to keep things intact as long as I could or to work with lenders and, and, and just make sure that they were either whole or get them as close to whole as possible. Um, the banks were the challenging ones to deal with. But ultimately, I maintained really good relations with, a, with the majority of our private lenders that we had. And, um, and, and obviously, we didn't do deals for three years following the crash. But when it was time to get back into the, the, the game, those are the first folks I went back to. I mean, they realized how, time, you know, how tough times had gotten. They realized that we were fully transparent and we did everything in our power to, to make things right. And we did. Um, and ultimately, went back to them when we had this idea of buying mobile home parks and actually getting into this, this niche. And so the very first park, uh, you know, ex-private lender of ours stepped in and uh, helped us finance the deal and finance the, uh, the repairs. And uh, ultimately stepped into the next couple out there after that until I was able to build up a track record and also, you know, get some financials underneath my belt, some historicals. And uh, by that point in time, it was a little bit easier to get bank financing and, um, and the rest is really history. So, I mean, it, the first couple of deals were really challenging, but those private lenders were the ones that, those relationships that we, that we, that we maintained, those were the ones that made the deals happen because I wouldn't have been able to do them on my own. So um, today we still raise private capital, to do deals in a different format than that of uh, how we did it in the past. Um, we, we typically uh, raise it in a fund type format where we have multiple assets underneath one umbrella, uh, i.e. mobile home parks. Um, and so just you know, very similar business to what it was nine years ago, much larger in size and just a slightly different format of, of how we bring our capital in. Sure. So I'm actually most curious about that. So, so walk me through, um, when you funded your first deal, you say you had a private lender. Um, so were they lending on, on debt or they did the equity? Yeah, they were, yeah. they were, they were a debt lender. That's correct. Okay. So debt lender. And then you just threw the little bit of capital you had into the deal and they that, financed basically that, the whole thing. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the park needed, so I did have one other partner in the deal, an actual, you know, a, a true joint venture uh, operational partner. And so we each, we each put $50,000 into the deal, which is, uh, it, it needed about a 150 total rehab. And so the lender put up the entire amount of the actual purchase price. And he, you know, uh, he, he basically financed the other 50,000 that we needed to do the repairs. We had a lot, of, we had basically all of our skin in the game. That's all the skin we had. Yeah. And uh, we put it all in there. And so, um, and he also knew that, that we, I mean, we were picking up at a phenomenal price. I mean, you know, we bought it at, we bought it at 200 K, uh, put 150 into it. And, uh, that property after we got it stabilized, um, after debt service would, would yield right around $90,000 a year of pure cash flow. Wow. Uh, after all expenses and debt service. And then we just sold it. Uh, like I said, we just sold it five or six months ago. Uh, I think the final purchase price was like 1.27 million. So, I mean, it, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, th there was, we built a lot of equity into it and it was a very safe position for that investor to be in. And, um, and ultimately he, we had worked with him on other projects and he had seen, you know, us take, you know, tackle large rehab projects in the past. So he wasn't overly concerned. Sure. So then did you transition to kind of doing like single asset raises where you'd bring in multiple limited partners and buy one mobile home park at a time? That's correct. Yeah. For like the, the next seven or eight parks, exactly what it was. Yeah, exactly what it was. And a couple of times, like we would buy like two or three at a time, but they were all individual raises. Um, yep. And until we, until we can really build a track record to go out and do a fun type format, you know, with the fun format, 
the first fund we did, we did have a couple of the assets identified. So it wasn't completely blind. You know, our investors, they at least had a uh, preliminary look at a couple of the deals that were probably going to make it into the fund, but they didn't, they weren't fully clear as to maybe the additional three or four that were going to end up in the fund. Right. And so there's, there's a lot of trust there. And uh, the only way that you gain that trust is with a track record. So we waited until we felt we had enough of a track record, enough, you know, plenty of case studies to basically say, hey, here's what we've done over the past X number of years. This is why we love mobile home parks. And here's what we intend to do moving forward. Would you like to come along for the ride? So it's a little bit sure. easier of a story to, to, uh, to, you know, to gravitate towards from an investor's perspective if you've got that case study, case studies to go along with it. Yeah. So the case studies, what are some of the other tips you would give to people that are kind of on that brink of, hey, I've done a bunch of single asset funds. Now I think the time might be right to start a blind kind of pre-raise multi-asset fund. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's uh, uh, it's assuming that they're going to do a, uh, you know, a, a, a fund, but with the same type of assets, right? Like if they've been yep. value add, you know, apartment investors, they're going to continue to do the same thing. They just want to do multiple underneath one umbrella. Yep. I think it's just important to document. I mean, I'm talking about in a very granular nature, document every aspect of all the other deals that you've done. And it's, it, that makes for the compelling story. I mean, there's really no other argument at that point in time. There's really, there's not many other things that would make a potential investor uneasy if you've proven them. Like we literally intend to do the same thing. It's just our deal flow is so significant. So that's the reason why we did the fund. Our deal flow, we're always really good about having deal flow. And we do a lot of off-market, you know, direct to owner type stuff. And so we've always had, seems to be more deals than we've had the ability to get funding, you know, to do like individual deal specific syndications. Like a couple of times right. we'd have to make decisions like, well, we're just not going to do that one or the other one because we've got these two we're working on. And like logistically, it's, it's just too challenging and just, you know, difficult to do. And so um, I would say the most important part is make sure you got the deal flow to do it before you go open up a fund. Because once you actually start bringing that capital in, you better be able to deploy it. Right. You, better have a, you better have a home for it. I, I'd say sure. that's probably the biggest mistake that new fund managers make is they, you know, they 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 start raising capital. They say, "Hey, I'm going to buy you know, fifty million dollars multifamily assets." Um, they've got the first maybe one or two each ten million dollar assets identified, um, but ultimately they don't necessarily know how long or when uh, those other three assets are going to come into the picture, right? And if they're sure. On a, on a really aggressive capital raise on the front side, one of two things happens. Either they bring the capital in and now it starts ticking up the pref and it gets very expensive very quickly. And so they start making bad decisions, poor decisions on what type of assets to deploy it in. And sure. so they buy inferior deals or um, they bring the capital into more of an escrow account. They don't call it down yet and just sits there and it sits there for three months, for five months, for six months. And their investors starting to get they start getting upset that their money hasn't actually been put to use yet. And ultimately they get a bad taste in their mouth. So. Sure. Um, do you ever do it where they, um, well, you know, where they sign subscription agreements or whatever they commit them to a certain dollar amount, but rather than them actually funding an escrow account, like they keep the money and then you call it down directly from them. We've done all the above. So we've actually brought it in right out of the gate when we've had plenty of deals to deploy it. Uh, we put it in more of like a third party trust account. So it's actually there. It's been taken out of the uh, investor's bank. Account. That's what we do today. It's more efficient. Um, and so it goes into a trust account, but also we know that we can deploy that capital within a reasonable period of time. And then we've also done it to where they just fill out the subscription agreement. And then, you know, basically we call that capital from them when, when it's necessary. And there's just a lot of moving parts and a lot of logistics in that last example, when basically they just felt the subscription agreements and uh, basically we got to go on a scramble to get that capital from folks. Cause you know, people change their mind that they, if they, if, if they don't make that financial commitment, when, when they mentally make it, if they don't make it with their checkbook, then the chances are there's going to be attrition there and th that attrition is hard to account for. And so um, we, we have opted to go with a, kind of the middle ground where it goes into a third party trust account and then we pull it down from there, but it doesn't start accumulating pref until we pull it down from that trust account. So it's there gotcha. at our reach. Um, and, uh, and we pull it in when it's ready to be deployed. But we all, again, the important thing there is that we don't, we don't just pull it in without any idea of when we're going to be able to deploy it. Like we want to give them an indication of, Hey, you know, it's going to be over the next, you know, one to one to two months, two to three months, whatever it is, whatever we feel is realistic. That way they got expectations set and their money is not just sitting there where it could be somewhere else, you know, getting a return for them. Yeah. All right. Well, this went in a whole different direction than I thought, but I'm loving it. Um, so uh, let's circle back before I move on to my next question. You had talked about documenting the deals in a very linear way. What are like the top maybe three to five things that like kind of data points that you feel are the most important things that you should document on your deals? 
Yeah, I mean, it's so again, assuming let's talk about apartments, right? Here's the market. Here's why we love this market. Here's why we've done multiple deals in this marketplace, right? Highlight the market itself because the market really is, is most of the time, it's the most important factor of the entire deal because you can fix the deal. You can fix the ugly apartment complex, but you can't fix the marketplace. So sure. really harp on the reasons why you love the marketplace. Uh, and then, you know, what you paid for it, what that entire business plan looks like. And ultimately what that end result's going to be like, you know, we're going to do, you know, $10,000 worth of interior renovations to each one of the units. We paid 45,000 for each unit, 10,000 renovations, rent to it for 55. And after it's all said and done with a $150 rent bump, ultimately we expect that each one of those units is going to have a value of approximately $90,000, know, whatever those, whatever those economics are, but make it very clear and make it very simple. I think just, you know, the, the old, old acronym, keep it simple, stupid, right? The, Right. Yes. Methodology. Keep it incredibly simple and make it very clear that anyone reading that understands your business from beginning to end. I don't think you have to overcomplicate it. Put a 20 page PowerPoint together. That's not necessary. Um, just clear and concise the market, what you paid for it, what you intend to do, your business plan, and ultimately what the end result is. And another factor in there that might be relevant to some folks like for us, like we really harp on the fact that 90% of the deals that we bought over the, over the years in mobile home parks have been directly off market. We've sourced them ourselves. We've gone direct to owner. And so that's a big stick for us because we're not competing with others on majority of those deals. Like they're not really out the market. There's not five other buyers in line. And so more than likely we're getting it at a discount to what it would be if it went out to the main marketplace. So if you're one of those folks, I'd probably harp on that as well. Cause that's, that's, that's a huge value add for your investors. Meaning that you're getting deals at, the majority of the other marketplace, you know, your competitors aren't getting access to. Sure. And so it seems like when you're talking about all this now, you're talking about kind of pitching them on the deals to come, right? When you're pitching your fund? No, no. Well, no, I, well, I, I would, I would initially well, pitch them on the deals what I, that I've done. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you would talk about and the then I would, where yeah, the market would, was when you bought those? What's that? Like, okay. So you're, you're going through all the deals you've done. Let's say one of them was something you bought three years ago. Are you talking about, I think the one that threw me off was talking about the market. Are you talking about like, what was the market when you bought that asset? No, like the more, why you like that market. Like why, if you're buying in Atlanta, the Atlanta MSA, like why you like the Atlanta MSA, this is assuming that you're buying, you know, let's say that you, you've, you've done multiple deals. You've done 10 deals. You did them in Atlanta, Chattanooga and uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I'm just picking three off the top of my head. Gotcha. I'm assuming most multifamily investors, and so this is my only applicable to multifamily. Most folks choose like, one, two or three markets, right? Like they're not just right. buying all over the place. And so they're buying in markets and they've done really well markets. And so they more, typically continue the trend in those same marketplaces because they like the economics uh, of, sure. of that marketplace. And so that's what I'm speaking to when I say mention the market and why you like that market so much. Make sure you educate sure. these new potential investors on why you like that market and why it's good to invest there. And so I'd roll through my case studies and then ultimately, and so that's what we've done. That's what we intend to do. Here's what a new format looks like. Um, here's what that looks like for you, Mr. Investor. Would you like to come along for the ride? I mean, it's. Sure. Uh, it... That's awesome. So then, um, like, yeah, let, let, you... let your experience in your deals sell your investors. Let, let, let right. your deals and your past experience get them comfortable with what you're capable of and what and they can better visualize what this new opportunity for them getting involved is going to look like for them. You know, if it goes anything like the other 10 you've done, that's why the track record is so important. Now, if you only done one deal, one could say that's probably not a track record. That doesn't mean you can't replicate it on the second one, but the, the odds are, you know, the odds are kind of in the middle of whether or not that, that goes that way. But if you've done 10 and they've all followed a similar theme and pattern, then chances are that the 11th, you know, unless you pivot completely and do something else, is going to be probably similar performance and similar outcome for that investor. Sure. That totally makes sense. So then talking about, uh, so you're pulling the capital down, your pref accumulates and stuff like that. Like uh, obviously it's, it's uh, some private information on how the exact specifics, but just get, run me through the general idea of how you're structuring. Are you, are you doing like a pref plus a fixed split after that? Or are you doing like a multi-tier waterfall or what are you generally doing? Yeah, we do, we do have a multi-tiered waterfall and it's based on how much capital uh, the investor puts in. So we've got a couple of different classes. And so it ranges from six, seven to eight pref, depending on, you know, the minimum amount of capital is hundred K. So from like hundred K to 249 uh, to six pref from, from 250 to, I think it's uh 499 is a seven pref. And then anything five, 500 K and above is a, is an eight pref. Um, the 70, 30 split um, after we, after we hit that pref and um 
uh, what else? I think that's 100K minimum investment. I think I'd mentioned that. Um, but we, we try to keep it simple as well with our with our with our waterfall structure and, and and just the overall structure of the syndication. I've seen some, you know, some some more complicated and complex structures. But I mean, I, I feel if you're if you're an investor, it's a typical retail investor, which most of the folks that are investing in the syndications that you and I are seeing on a regular basis, most of them they're not like they're not you know uh, fund managers or they're not it's not private equity firms or um, you know, family offices or anything like that. Uh, you, most of them are just retail investors. They probably don't have a ton of experience um, with the you know different varieties of waterfall structures and, and and you know prep structures and what have you. So keep it simple, stupid. Same thing. It just even though they're smart folks, make sure they can right. understand it. Make sure they can also articulate that to their either their accountant or you know whoever they go to for advice. Right? They can articulate to their attorney, their legal counsel, what have you. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's great. And then are you, are you targeting uh, uh, like high net worth individuals and that yeah, kind of all, stuff? Yeah, all credited. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've only ever done Reg D506Cs, uh, you know, from our first fund moving forward. And um, it just, you know, being able to take advantage of the general solicitation and, and putting it out there on, you know, through podcasts and, and social media. We just saw that there was much more of a benefit of doing that than there was, you know, do, doing the B and not being able to solicit and then opening up our investment to smaller tiers, you know, or to those that are, you know, non-sophisticated or you know, non-accredited investors and taking smaller amounts of money. In fact, the very first fund we did, we kind of had a, you know, the, the, the norm, at least then was 50 K minimum investment. Like that was the normal threshold that people kind of ran with. We're like, well, would we rather have 20 investors or 10 investors? Right. And so why don't we make it a hundred K and then we can make a determination thereafter. If that was a good idea. Um, and we didn't know how it was going to go. And ultimately we found that maybe we missed one investor that would have put 50 in that, you know, ultimately didn't want to put a hundred in to, to dip the toe in the water, but yeah. we haven't had an issue. And uh, that, that's, that's been a, that's been a, we look back and, and, and figure that that was an incredibly smart move on our part. You know, so sure. with the total number of investors we have today, uh, we ended up with a, I'd say a, a, a slightly more sophisticated batch of investors, but also a total number of less investors than what we would have if we would have made the threshold, you know, half of, uh, half of what we did. Sure. Yeah. I like, I like the hundred K minimum, you know, and, and, and people, especially people who invest with you the first time, have you found they kind of like gravitate towards the minimum? Yeah. I, 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 I guess you it's probably, it's probably, probably, you... probably one out of every five will do more than the minimum. Um, but I'd say, you know, the other four wow. will just do the minimum. It's like 80%. Is that, yeah. that's why you structured uh, the three different classes with the higher profit to try yeah. and incentivize them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and I mean, like the second time around, like we get repeat investors that, you know, have invested in all of our funds. It's a little different, right? As they, right, right, they've right, seen right. Results. again, goes back to track record and case studies, right? Like they get you see the proof in the pudding. It's a little different thereafter. Sure. And are you guys, so uh, a mobile home park, does it operate much like uh, an apartment where you hire a third-party management company who's kind of on site and stuff like that? Give me, give me some of the, like, give me the five-minute summary on mobile home parks. And then uh, yeah. I know you got a hard stop here so we can button it up. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that they did uh, operate in that manner to where you could just go find one of many, you know, third-party management companies and have them step in and handle the day-to-day. -day. But that's unfortunately not the case. There are a few third-party management companies out there and a few that are very large on a national scale. We've actually tested all of them and uh, had a very lackluster experience. Um, it's probably a kind way to put it, but a very lackluster experience with uh, with all of them, even the largest that was on a national scale. And so that's one of the, I guess it's, a, you can look at it as a pro or a con of this industry in that if you want to scale more than like one or two mobile home parks where kind of you're running the show, maybe you have an assistant to, you know, to own five, six, seven, eight, nine, at that point in time, you're going to have to build out your own internal property management company. You're going to have to literally build out that, that side of your business, which is not the sexiest part of the industry. Like it's not necessarily a great money-making endeavor. It's kind of a necessary evil. Uh, and so that, that creates a barrier to entry for those that don't want to go that route, right? Like someone that might have scaled, but says, you know what? I don't want to run a property management company. I don't want to be overly involved in the operation side of the business. I don't want to go vertical with it. And so again, that's why I say there's a pro, pro and con there. It creates a barrier to entry for folks that don't want to take that next step. Um, but yeah, no, the, the third party management, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not really a luxury. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking you're going to, Hey, I'm going to go buy 3000 mobile home units and I'm just going to outsource it. Like I've done in apartments, go back to the drawing board. Uh, the, sure. That's not the right way to do it. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really great. Um, well, Hey, I really appreciate having you on the show, Kevin. And, uh, I, I mean, I took a ton out of this, so, uh, we're going to summarize that in a moment here, but before we do, I got my personal question of the day. 
And sure. that's uh, if you had one life or one day left to live, uh, what would you do with it? Not sleep and spend all that time with my immediate family and uh, and and you know my my parents and and in laws and things of that nature. Literally, just throughout Lily, probably jack myself up on a bunch of coffee or whatever, whatever it took to stay awake <laughs> that entire time and just spend it with the ones I love the most. Oh, that's so great, man! It's all about the relationships, and at the end of the day, the the impact we leave on those we love, right? That's it. That's it. That's a pretty emotional question. And as you start thinking about it, yeah, it is right. <laughs> At least it just got a little emotional for me as I thought through what I was just saying there, you know, but yeah, you know, uh... no, it, and it's like, I asked that because a lot of people don't really think about that every day. Right. But you know, sometimes you lose people around you and you just, it kind of reminds you that, you know, tomorrow isn't promised. So yeah, you know, no, trying to live, live each day like that. I so. agree. It's, it's somewhat morbid, but it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's the appropriate way to think of every day, you know, and, uh, sometimes we've got, we've got not so stellar days or shitty days or what have you, but ultimately just be grateful that we're here, you know, and that we've got a, a another day of kicking and living. So, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And, uh, how can people get a hold of you if they want to contact you? Yeah. So my personal website, kevinbuff.com, you can go there. You can use the contact us page. Uh, uh, tells a little bit more about me and, and some of the endeavors I'm involved in. And then also our company website is sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And uh, you can also use that contact us page. And one way or another, that message will make its way to me. All right, man. Well, hey, I uh, appreciate it. You're a blessing. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you having me, my friend. Yes. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.cre franchise.com and as a bonus just for attending i'm going to throw in a free audio copy of my book as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools that's www.crefranchise.com we'll see you in there